being a really, really good listener um, is, is crucial in, in this, right? Um, you know, at the end of the day, when I sit and I do a discovery meeting with a client, I really want to be doing about 20% of the talking compared to 80% of the client. It's it's going to be about them. If I'm doing my job correctly, uh, then I'm I'm asking those probing, open-ended questions to get them to 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 really open up, right? Um, you know, my, my practice is, is a value-based practice. And so, you know, part of my discovery process is that we go down uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And, and, and because I want to know uh, what's important to them outside of the money, um, because they're going to be with me for years. And it's, it's not, it, it, whatever they say, it's not about the dollar sign or the, uh, the numbers. It's always going to be something else. It's the same reason we get up in the morning to go to work or get, get into the office, right? Uh, we have very thing, uh, very specific things that drive us. So being conscious of that uh, in my process, okay, now that I'm saying it, I have a process. <laughs> so that, that, that's, that's very tactical. I have a very specific defined process that I use every time, uh, repeatable. Uh, when when I meet with a client, um, and so then I'm making sure that I'm touching those areas that are important. I'm making sure to keep track of that and making sure that they're fresh on my memory when these things come up in the future as well. Welcome to the Art and Science of Difficult Conversations. I'm Chris. And I'm Lucy, and we love having difficult conversations. That's right. And each week, we'll either share a tip, hear how others have gotten better at difficult conversations, or demonstrate common difficult conversations and what to do and what not to do. Let's get into it. Christopher, welcome for joining me on the, our podcast. Absolutely, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. I'm super excited to be here. And I'm always a big fan of meeting other Christophers. Uh, I won't introduce too much of what you do now because I want you to share kind of in your own words. What do you do and how did you get to where you're at? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I, I have a couple of different hats that I wear. Um, my for-profit business is I'm a financial advisor. I'm the owner of Houston First Financial Group, and I've been doing that for about 20 years now. Uh, but I also am a podcaster as well. In fact, you were on my show earlier this month, which is That's about right. to cut come out here in the next couple of days or so. Um, and we had a great conversation on that. Uh, so I wear, you know, wear a couple different uh, hats there. Uh, that, the show Money Matters podcast, we've been on the air for about uh, 10 years, um, which in podcasting terms is a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And so so uh, really you know, people either know me through the podcast or for, for the financial planning and retirement planning that I do. Yeah. And how did you get into this? How did did you always want to become work in finance and, and working with money? Oh, God no. So, yeah. Okay. So yeah. No, that's a great question. So that's actually like a. Um, so no. So I studied uh, philosophy and English in college, and mm. I managed a bookstore when I was back in school. Um, I am one of these people that I I was, was like, how did I get into to finance? Right. Um, when I was younger, so I just hit 50, uh, one of the things is I used to look at the newspaper. And when I got to the business section, there would just be these this ocean of numbers and percentage signs and symbols and letters. And it was always kind of like a mystery to me as to what this is. Kind of the way I think is like the more complex it is, it's more of a challenge for me. So I'm like, oh, what is that? So I, I actually, uh, when I was at the bookstore, uh, one of my employees there was moonlighting. And he was a banker, believe it or not. And he was moonlighting part time at the bookstore. And so he kind of hit me to finance and stocks and investment. It was an area that I, I want to say I was always interested in and kind of attracted to just from the idea of like, what is this about? And um, he was somebody who kind of, and I said, mentored me, but got me started down that road. Um, I'm kind of dating myself, you know, uh, back in the 90s, I bought Yahoo and when it went IPO. Mm -hmm. And then we turn yeah. around and sold it and bought a couch at Ikea with the with the proceeds. I want to say that's about the most 90s <laughs> reference that you can you can <laughs> give. Um, and and so that kind of got me started down that road. Um, 
when you know I start I wanted to be a philosophy professor but uh, I looked at the my professors back then and this is a generalization I, I looked at happiness units <laughs> how happy were the people actually teaching philosophy and the professors very intelligent super intelligent people great in groups not very happy so uh, the the more I learned about what it took to be a, a professor and in the publisher parish I just I realized this wasn't exactly what I wanted to do uh, and then I started uh, down the road of financial planning, and I was the top uh, first year advisor at American Express Financial Advisors, which doesn't even exist anymore. <laughs> um, and so that was kind of one of those things that if you're if you've got the entrepreneur spirit and you do really well, kind of gets in your blood, and there's no turning back if you know the the entrepreneur types. Um, and that got me kind of sent down that set down that road, and and uh, you know fast forward. I've uh, been doing this for 20 years and manage millions of dollars of retirement assets now. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Great question. So. Yeah. I love that backstory because I think there's a lot of jobs that exist that kids don't know about. And so there's like the job I do, nobody like there's no way me as a kid would have known this existed. So to even conceptualize it is wild. Right. You don't have a lot of kids raising their hand and saying, oh, I'm going to be a financial. It, it yeah. just doesn't <laughs> enter into the scope at that point. Right. Like... Right. 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 And so, you know, one of the reasons I'm excited to talk to you is because my wife and I have had a financial advisor since we got married. Instrumental, super instrumental. Everybody listening should get a financial advisor. Number one thing, you should get a financial advisor because money is hard to talk about. And when my wife and I got married, we had no idea how to combine our finances, how to think about finances. We had lots of loans that we were trying to pay off at the same time. So helpful to get our everything in order, pay off our finances. We've got insurance that we thought were like, do we really need extra life and disability insurance? Turns out, yes, yes, we do need extra life and disability insurance. 100%. Yeah, I've never had a widow look at me and say, oh, we've got too much insurance. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, that's that's a thing. Um, uh, and it's one of those things that I think we tend to think we're, you know, we're going to live forever. Or you've got that kind of idea in the back of your head, like, man, maybe we don't need this. But having had have having had having seen these how these things can play out, uh, it's definitely a, a good thing when when stuff happens, right? Yeah, yeah, it's like, that's really the essence of it, right? Like this is in case something catastrophic happens and, you know, our financial advisor, cause like the work, both me and my wife do are white collar workers, right? So even if we get hurt or disabled, we can still kind of work. Uh, but our financial advisor was really able to help us think through like, what, it, like, yes, you're right. If, if you get hurt, you could still work. But what if you couldn't even do that? That means you are so catastrophically hurt that you do need some kind of income and some kind of way to do that medical support and so that that was like oh yeah you're right and then all that kind of stuff and so as we were talking before about kind of what what you wanted to share you know this podcast is about typical conversations um and it's timely because my my mom is downsizing her house my parents are you know older um so the idea of estate planning the idea of talking even about death and uh, finances was already hard Lots right. of people struggle with talking about finances, but even then talking about uh, death and planning what to do and thinking about that as a reality, you know, I guess, how did you even, how do you conceptualize? How do you get comfortable with that idea of talking about that topic or too heavy? Yeah. Topics? Yeah, for sure. So actually, I'm smiling a little bit because even I just used a euphemism when I said when stuff happens, right? But what I was talking about was death. Right? <laughs> uh, uh, and, and so it can be, uh, you know, a difficult topic, not just for, for us as professionals, but for, uh, you know, individuals, people just discussing death. I, I think um, we've all heard the idea that, you know, uh, uh, public speaking and death. Right? <laughs> uh, people hold these uh, on about the same level as far as things that they're afraid of uh, uh, and have uh, issues even even bringing up and discussing. Uh, the the good news after having uh, dealt with these issues for many years is that with estate planning, um, this can't. It's not as big a deal as people think when it when it comes to just sitting down and getting your core legal documents in place. Right. So there's this idea that if you just 
uh, approach or bring up the topic of death that, you know, sometimes I'll see clients start doing the hand wringing or, uh, you know, it's just, a, uh, you know, <laughs> just uncomfortable, just even uh, approaching it. Right. But it, it's actually the opposite. It's one of these things. Once you get started putting those plans in place, um, which would be your core legal documents, right? Your, your uh, will, your trust, your health care, your financial power of attorney, your health care surrogate, all of those things that you need to have as core legal documents once you have that stuff in writing it's almost like this weight just gets lifted off of your shoulders it's actually a relief because you've already got your intentions mapped mm. out documented on paper right now that's that's just the legal document side of it the other part of it is the conversations right that's mm. probably more that's actually probably more difficult <laughs> than the the legal documents right because it's it's approaching those conversations so you know if it's just a couple, let's say a mom and pop, right, uh, getting a simple will together and a simple estate issue, having that conversation is kind of a, like a one and done. We're, we got it done and, and, and um, we've got the legal documents done. But things change throughout your lifetime, right? We have deaths. Uh, adoptions, divorces, uh, births, right? These are all life events that could change your intention on your legal documents, right? So that's always, it's really not a, a, a static thing. It's a dynamic thing that we go back and have these conversations over and over. Another aspect of this that still falls into legacy planning and estate planning is having that conversation with the generation above you, right? So, you know, I just mentioned I'm 50. We're now at this age where uh, my generation are either becoming caretakers or there are certain aspects where we're having to step in and take on a different role than we've had to do in the past, right? Something we're uncomfortable with. Part of that caregiving or legacy talk is approaching that conversation with your elderly parents, right? Um, finding out if they have estate planning documents in place, what benefits do they have in place for their, their uh, healthcare needs as they age? Uh, sometimes if there's cognitive disabilities or dementia or Alzheimer's, we're literally having to go in there and kind of take control of the finances and, and help them do things like paychecks and continuing, you know, running the household, right? Uh, some of those uh, cognitive uh, diseases, those chronic illnesses, they're very unforgiving. Um, and so things that they did when they were younger, if it's not a family member who's having to step up, there's things that we may not have thought about that we have to get on our radar. Um, but just having that conversation with them, sitting down, um, but mm. sometimes we facilitated that conversation and it really depends on the, the family dynamic. Um, but it, it it could be as easy as just getting you and your siblings together and approaching this conversation with them. Uh, it could be having a neutral third party come in. Um, mm. it, it, the opposite way, coming from the parents. The parents may have absolute uh, uh, line in the sand expectations of what they want from the kids, and they might be the one who raise their hand and say, let's have this meeting and let's put some guidelines in place. It may not even be about the money, right? A lot of times uh, legacy could be about values and traditions and oral history and mm. things that they're, they're passing on just through a conversation. But if you don't start that conversation, none of these things get said, right? They're just kind of in the back of your head. Uh, they're not put out into the world. And so you're kind of leaving uh, your family um, out there to kind of guess or speculate like what your intentions are. Yeah. Right. And and that's the thing we we constantly, I don't like this word, preach on this podcast, Lucy and I, we constantly talk about difficult conversations. Yes, they're uncomfortable, but they are the key to moving your relationship forward and deeper and getting things done. You have to be transparent. So I'll I'll skip the legal stuff because that's beyond the scope of this podcast. But <laughs> I'm wondering, were you always comfortable with these kind of conversations? So, so no, <laughs> so, so just, just like any, anybody else uh, discussing death is, is heavy and weighty. Right. Uh, but what I found is, so I, I work mostly with retirees. So 55 and up who either five to 10 mm -hmm. years away from retirement or after having done this for 20 years, 
they've already they're already on the other side of retirement they're taking distribution and so my my clients have aged with me so you know i was started in my 20s i'm 50 now uh mm -hmm. and, and so they've aged right along with me so i've had a good bit of my clients pass i've had their spouses pass uh so so we're initially the main thing that i was helping people do was just retire right um you, you get signed up for jobs you didn't think you were you, you were going to do right well part yeah. of me helping helping them is helping them through this part of transition and through their lives and where it does come into play there's something called a a, a widow's penalty right so if you are married um and you file your taxes you're going to be at a lower tax bracket than than other people right mm. uh than singles so if you if you uh, have a spouse that passes, this is literally the last year that you can file as married filing jointly in that year. So I know a lot of people mm. give the advice, like if you're a widow, don't go out and make financial decisions right away. That's generally good advice. But when it comes to that widow's penalty and your taxes, this may be a reason that you'd want to make some changes in that low tax bracket. So there's things that we can do on the finance and the dollar sign dollar sign side uh, that are that's going to be a way that I can help, right? But the conversations, um, th yeah, this is just something that that as my clients have aged, we're realizing this is a super important thing to to, to discuss with them. Um, my company, Houston First Financial Group, uh, we have a, a Houston. Uh, HFFG legacy planning, which is a whole section where we help people with estate planning, but also caregiving. So just the mm. idea of having of falling into that new role that you're not used to. Uh, the, these are things that we've realized as the practice has grown that this is really kind of what we were hired to do that we didn't know. And here we are. So yeah. Yeah. So tell me, I mean, if you can remember, what was the, the first few conversations where you suddenly had to start talking about this? Do you remember what that was like for you or what, what was going through your mind? Yeah, you know, so it's all, you know, as you, as a financial advisor and as you go through your practice, you, you we are taught and trained to make sure that estate planning is a thing, that we have those conversations, okay. right? But there's a difference between being younger and having those conversations. Hey, everybody should have a will in place. This is just a good thing at the general practice across the board, right? To actually having your clients pass away, right? Very, very different conversation. I'm very empathetic. I'm somebody like, uh, like if you call me and you know, your spouse passed away, it's like, wow, okay, that's heavy, right? Um, and, and so being, um, uh, uh, but I'm trying to think of, of some of the earlier ones. I mean, in in when the pandemic came online, I had the most uh, clients pass away in the course mm. of the past two years than I had in the last you know 18 years prior to that. Um, and that was just kind of the beginning of that age group uh, uh, with that that coming online. Um, you know, the positives of this are I can see the gaps in the estate planning and uh, what people didn't do to prepare, uh, prepare mm. themselves or their spouse. And I always use the lessons that I've learned from that on new clients or existing clients. And it's through through real life uh, experiences. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely, you know, I'm uh, to get, I'm not going to name names because of confidentiality, sure. yeah, right? <laughs> but, but, but yeah, but to get a call from a client, it's like, Hey, Chris, my wife just passed. Um, you know, how does that affect us financially? You know, from a financial standpoint, we have to do some restyling of the accounts. We can offer guidance in them, re you know, settling the estate, the finance part of it, but we also can provide some guidance on, you know how to have those conversations with the kids and what professionals you need to to bring in and what things you should be approaching at this point and what things you should kind of put on hold or pause or pause right hey chris here i really appreciate you listening to this podcast and if you are listening to this podcast because you're looking to get better at these difficult conversations well if you really want to de-escalate difficult behaviors and you want to be assertive without being aggressive and being true to yourself, I have a self-paced course that can really help you because I know it's difficult being assertive in lots of different situations. If you're at work and you have to give feedback, if you have to deliver bad news to an employee or deliver bad news to somebody that you care about in your personal life, or you're struggling to deal with defensive or sensitive people who are pushing your buttons and you don't know how to push back. You know, it doesn't have to be that way. There is a world where you can handle these tough emotions with confidence. 
You can speak honestly and kindly while you're still being assertive. And you have the ability to manage emotional outbursts and stubbornness calmly. Because these are things that I've had to overcome and learn. And so this self-paced course goes through all of those things. I've created this trust framework that helps you think through how to prepare for and how to facilitate hard conversations. And you hear a lot of it actually in this podcast as I talk about how to handle difficult conversations in lots of different scenarios. Currently, the course is closed for enrollment. There's a waiting list. If you are interested in learning more, enrollment will open up at the end of August and the beginning of September. So please go to the website. I'll link it down below and you can learn more about it and join the waiting list if you want to hear more about it. But I'd love to see you there. Um, one of the main things that we like to point out is no surprises. We don't like any, any surprises. I think when it comes to money, nobody's excited yeah. when you get, you know, usually surprises are bad, right? So uh, things like social security, uh, once you, you, somebody passes away, they can proact, ro, uh, retroactively go back and pull social security from your spouse once they realize a date of death but it's social security, right? It's like the IRS, right? They may not realize it until months have passed, but they darn well will go back and correct it and change. And that changes how your, your budget is in your household, right? If you're used to budgeting from a two fam, uh, two person household, whether you're living off of social security or pension and that mm -hmm. changes, we kind of help you prepare on the front end. Hey, here's what we need to be looking for and that sort of thing. Um, even getting introduced to the children, uh, you know, that's the whole reason we do the legacy planning part is because hopefully by the time we get to that point, we've already talked to the children at least a few times. Uh, I have the benefit of it being a family practice. So often the kids have already been introduced to us and we're helping them with their financial uh, planning or their, their investments, right? But if we haven't, they may have called us once or twice in the past. And so having that relationship where the kids feel comfortable, like, hey, I know you've worked with my dad or you've worked with my mom in the past. Um, having that 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 uh, relationship mm -hmm. where they're not scared to pick up the phone and it's just another person getting lost in the numbers there. That's a huge part of it. It's, you know, people don't want to feel that way when they're grieving and they're going through uh, yeah. through this process. It's it, you want to make it as easy as possible. Yeah. What are your, I know I appreciate you sharing that, that there is a difference between how you're taught to do it. And then the real life experience of like sitting in the room with a person and they're like talking about this heavy topic or they're really worried about it. And how did you, has that impacted how you even talk to your own parents as they, as they've gotten to that age and you're starting to have more of these conversations? Yeah, I mean, my mom, so I've got a single parent mom, right? So my dad wasn't around, but but as a single parent yeah. mom, she's benefited from, from a lot of the mistakes oh, that good. I've seen other people make. And so um, it, it is it is a positive thing to see patterns, right? Um, when, when you're dealing with mo more than one person, uh, a lot of what we call wisdom and experience is really just pat high level pattern recognition, right? So, sure, so when sure. we, when, when we see lots of this same thing happen over and over to be able to kind of grab that experience and say, okay, I noticed this, and this is a, the right way to do it. And then to take that and to share that with others. Uh, so my mom's had the benefit of, uh, of that, uh, but, um, I'm sure any other uh, professional medical uh, person would say the same thing. Sometimes that doesn't translate too much to your personal life across the board, right? So every family dynamic is is different. Um, but but yeah, so that, that's you know one of the reasons I got started in retirement planning is my mom worked for a hospital um, early in her career, and she got. Um, uh, her, her financial advisor guy was just an annuity guy. Uh, mm. and so he sold her like a fixed annuity. Um, and that was one of the things when I was, uh, of the age of reason, or something. once I figured out, you know, it's like, Hey, wait, maybe this was not the best thing or the right thing. You know, uh, that was one of the things that pointed me towards this career, because a lot of, this is one of those topics or areas that people, you know, they just get kind of glazed over. They don't want to get into the, the details of it and they'll make bad mistakes. Right. So, um, being able to 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 have these experiences with my own clients, uh, hopefully she's benefited from them. I'm gonna knock on wood here. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you you talked about like creating that environment where that people are gonna be safe or feel comfortable, and you're an outs a lot of times you're an outsider by nature of the work you're doing. You're an outsider. You're not in the family, and 
And I know that like, yes, sometimes having an outsider helps kind of reduce some of that emotionality uh, of that, of that situation. But what do you, what, what's your personal tips of like, how do you create that atmosphere of safety of opening? Let's, let's have an open dialogue and conversation. Like what are your specific go-to tips? Yeah. So I'm going to say that it's, it's high trust. So, you know, I have the benefit of this being a family practice. So the whole idea around the practice is that we take in family trees instead of individual clients. And so that Mm. if somebody hires me, I'm doing a financial plan for that individual. But if they have children or they have parents, then that family tree is given the same uh, financial advice and planning for like no no additional costs. So that's why we we take in uh, family trees, right? So the benefit of that is like when you say, um, you know, you're not a family member, there, it, what's strange is that we're sort of, uh, you know, uh, adopted family. I mean, I have families where I'm, I'm talking to the sisters, I'm talking to the ki- all three of the kids that have, you know, went from high school to college, and they're they're leaning on me for for this advice uh, because the parents trust me so much that they're saying, hey, you know, you need to talk to Chris before you make any de- decisions there. Um, so so when it comes, those conversations are easier because it's that high trust relationship there. I'm going to make the argument that if you're not doing that and you're seen as like an outsider or just another professional, it's either not going to happen or it's going to be very, very difficult uh, for them for them to do that, right? So I, mm. I was kind of planting the seed years ago when, when I started with these clients and we just built these relationships up so that it just happens very easily now compared to, um, I would even say if I just took a new client in and something like that happened, um, it, it's more and more difficult for them to open up and trust you or, 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 or even have you in their mind as this is the person I need to tap for this, this uh, advice, right? So I guess what, you know, saying it out loud, time has a lot to do with it. Um, sure. You know, let me get, that let's time. get really tactical though. I really yeah, I want to yeah. see like, because you're right trust i agree totally like in any kind of relationship that's the key what are your what do you remember doing to build that trust yeah i mean this is and this is probably on this show right it's for difficult conversations this is probably not the first time people have heard this uh active listening um you know being a really really good listener um is is crucial in, in this right um you know, at the end of the day, when I sit and I do a discovery meeting with a client, I really want to be doing about 20% of the talking compared to 80% of the client. It's it's going to be about them. If I'm doing my job correctly, uh, then I'm I'm asking those probing, open-ended questions to get them to 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 really open up, right? Um, you know, my, my practice is, is a value-based practice. And so, you know, part of my discovery process is that we go down uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs and, and, and because I want to know uh, what's important to them outside of the money. Um, because they're going to be with me for years. And it's it's not, it, it, whatever they say, it's not about the dollar sign or the uh, the numbers. It's always going to be something else. It's the same reason we get up in the morning to go to work or get, get into the office, right? Uh, we have very, thing, uh, very specific things that drive us. So being conscious of that uh, in my process Okay, now that I'm saying it a lot, I have a process. <laughs> so that, that that's that's very tactical. I have a very specific defined process that I use every time, uh, repeatable uh, when when I meet with a client. Um, and so then I'm making sure that I'm touching those areas that are important. Um, I'm listening. I'm making sure to keep track of that. Um, and 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 making sure that they're fresh on my memory when these things come up in the future as well. It's it's interesting how much active listening cuts across like every type of profession that requires relationship and trust building. Hundred percent. I'm still learning this. I mean, I've been. I I was. You know, at one point, I was an HR trainer and I taught active listening. Right. Uh, but but it, what's interesting is that now with technology, um, I'm using a software called Avoma that does, um, and it's similar to some of these other uh, AI voice capture uh, note taking uh, um, software that's out there. But what this one does different, it kind of. Rec- towards the entire meeting and it goes back and it tells you what percentage you talked versus the person that you're talking 
uh, with. And it really, really, as for somebody who's also a leader, I've got staff here. Um, it, it, if I'm having a meeting with my assistant and I realize that it's 80% me talking versus 20% her talking, not good, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so this is where I, I am using some tools that are, I, I guess now that we're saying this out I'm using some tools that are also, you know, to this day still, it's it's a skill that you you just get better and better at um, and being open to to learning and changing. Um, um, and that's one of the tools that I've been using lately to help me with that. Mm. The the tool that I have here with us, Fathom, that's uh, it keeps popping up every now and then, like how much is it am i talking what percentage of the time oh nice it does the same thing it tells me how much i'm talking versus the other person <laughs> nice nice i have heard fathom i haven't tried it but i was on a uh, webinar this week where it got mentioned in the top three of the of these types of uh programs out there so i, I might have to check it out so. and i guess maybe I, I don't know if i'm allowed to even mention it but it's free mm -hmm. right like if you go to the website it's oh, free yeah. for individuals so yeah great yeah. deal <laughs> yeah yeah i mine i'm paying uh 24 dollars a month for it and the only thing that um well there's a couple things but it it allows you to archive the actual video stuff so uh, the reason i'm mentioning this is because when i'm going back and doing a financial plan um i, I will go back to these recorded conversations and go to the key moments, right? So, mm. you know, a lot of times when you meet with a client, they're like, well, was he really listening? <laughs> you know, is that stuff that it's actually getting captured? Well, this tool that I have, uh, it allows me to put keywords in there and go back and like, okay, what did she say about her parents? Every instance of her speaking about her parent comes up in there and, you know, it's it's a very good time saver and, and I want, it's not detracting, it's adding. So uh, I'm being more and more open to these, these types of tools. So. <laughs> yeah. I'd love to know, you know, what are one to two takeaways our listeners could have of just things they could think about to start doing to get comfortable talking about this with their own parents you know, or, or themselves to start talking about this, this estate planning and planning for the inevitab inevitability of death. Yeah, you know, so we provide a, a guidebook of resources that kind of helps you approach this conversation. But without having something like that, just having this, just starting the conversation with your parents. Um, you know, you might use other examples of, of your uh, people that are around you that have had similar situations and said, you know, my, my friend Jane or my friend John had this experience with their parents. Uh, boy, that was, wasn't good. Or boy, that worked out okay. And here's why. Um, and that might be a way to kind of test bubbles approaching the conversation, right? Um, that doesn't work. Be very direct. <laughs> You know, tell tell them specifically why, why you're doing it. Um, often this comes up with somebody's financial plan, because if mom and dad did, maybe didn't have the best plan in place or aren't doing the right things, um, when some of the things that we mentioned earlier, like like Alzheimer's or Parkinson come online, um, this might be a financial responsibility for you that you didn't expect. Right. So part of good mm. financial planning is, is looking for all of those question marks and try. we plan for the best. Uh, our plan for the worst, hope for the best, right? But we want to get rid of all of those question marks and to be determines and unknowns. Um, and so that that's part of it is literally bringing up that conversation. Some of the parents will be proactive and will tell you, right? If they have specific things they want to do with trust or I, we've got people that, you know, I want to leave a bequest behind for my children or even my grandchildren. Um, you know, I want them to, if they go to college, we're going to give them this much. If they don't, we're not going to give them anything thing right you can get into the weeds you can really kind of dial this stuff in you're the opposite of that where there's been no planning at all so the question that you had about those initial conversations that's super powerful that really just starts the the uh the flywheel go going towards the positive direction right and even if it's negative right even if they come back and say who are you <laughs> you know hey, i'm your mom i'm your dad why are you asking this stuff you know that was kind of the worst case scenario right isn't it kind of good to know that early on, right? Yeah. If there's some, some some blockage there or some reason as to why they're not approaching the topic, it's bet what's the worst they can do. And if if that comes up, um, that's that's probably the the reason you should initiate it to begin with. You kind of want to know those things, right? So yeah, mm. it just a little bit. It's 
still related, but it's a little bit of a tangent. I, how do you approach families where the siblings might be fighting over kind of what they see as a fair share or try to influence in some way um, getting more or less or whatever, just that the idea of, because, you know, uh, yeah. money makes everybody a little bit wild. So how do you yeah, yeah. approach those conflicts and those dynamics? Yeah. So this is a huge issue, especially with the age group that I'm working with. Right. So anybody who's over 55, if they have been married once, divorced and remarried, there's a high probability that they have a blended family with with children from one marriage and children from a second marriage. And then they're trying to put this together. Right. They're mm -hmm. trying to put this household together, these finances together. So that's a recipe for for hurt feelings, right? So, right. So, yeah, so for sure. So so having um, one, just building the, the importance of how important it is to define those things. Uh, even right at the beginning of the second marriage, when you're putting together two past lives into one financial household, uh, sometimes they have the... Uh, the idea that they're keeping separate finances because they've had some past mistakes with finances. So they put up this kind of firewall. But when it comes to the styling of the accounts and the estate planning side of it, we're in a, a Texas here where it's um, a community property, right? So even some of the things that they do where they might think that they have independence by having separate accounts, the state doesn't look at it like that, right? So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so making sure that you have this discussion so that you know how all of those things work with the assets uh, being distributed the way that you think that they should, and that's about intention, right? So intention, they have to say it out loud. Uh, they have to talk it out. Um, the earlier, the better. You know, we, we, we are not uh, I'm a certified estate and trust specialist, but I'm not an attorney, so I can't draft the legal documents. But our job is to quarterback it, bring it up, you know, help them have that conversation to facilitate the conversation. The end result is avoiding that kind of a, a, a family dynamic where people are, are fighting, right? Um, if the parents want to give two things, not to be a financial burden to their family or to not be a source of contention, this is super important for them to do because by them saying it out loud and putting their intentions in writing, anybody that's left here to grieve, they're not having to, to uh, be a mind reader or, or speculate what the parents mm. wanted, right? It's kind of written, it's defined, um, and then they're allowed to grieve and to focus on the, the emotional part of it, because this stuff's all happened behind the scenes. It's already done, right? It really shouldn't be, <laughs> shouldn't be a thing that we're, we're still talking about after people pass and, and, and uh, siblings argue, but every family's different. There's always a different, you know, different dynamic going on. The earlier that you bring these conversations up, the better, because you get all of those things out in the open. Um, you know, it is interesting facilitating conversations with families like that. Uh, but it is, I'm sure from what you do as a living for a living, you've seen this, this kind of stuff. And it's, it's super important for, for families to discuss this and bring that stuff up. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. Well, this is really interesting, Christopher. Again, I love this topic because <laughs> I've been forced to get comfortable with it. And um, I just think it's so important. So uh, where can people find you? Where can people follow you if they want to learn more, if they want to just get in follow you and get in contact with you and your podcast? Yeah, absolutely. So for my for my financial planning practice, it's www.houstonfirstfinancialgroup.com. Uh, but for the podcast that we've been over 10 years, I've, I've got, you know, even though Money Matters is probably one of the most common <laughs> names for a financial advisor podcast out there, I have www.moneymatterspodcast.com. So I grabbed that one early <laughs> and I can easily point people to that one. So that's the one I usually send people to. And I'm always encouraging people to subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's only come on online for the last two years or so. So we're really trying to, to get that going as well. Awesome. And we'll put all those in the show notes so everybody can follow along and, and access. Uh, but Christopher, thank you so much for being on the show. I really appreciate it. I and I love being on your show too. Absolutely. I love it. We had such a great conversation on, on the show, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago that it feel, I felt like this was a continuation of it. And, and I, yeah. I was uh, very honored to be on your show as well. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Christopher. All right. Have a good one.